Have you ever tried to help somebody who would not accept your help or listen to your advice? Were you frustrated? That is God's problem. The Creator is the only one that can solve the problem of death, but even He cannot solve this problem for you if you are not willing to listen to His advice. Did you know that this is the underlying problem of a large share of the Christian world today? Stay tuned, we'll see. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. What do you do when you want to help somebody and you can help them, but they won't accept your help? They won't listen. What are you going to do? Did you know that is the problem that God has had to deal with with the human race for many, many centuries? How does God deal with this problem when a person or a church or a nation will not listen to his counsel or advice? We'll see what the Lord does in just a moment. We'll read it from the Bible. But first, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand His holy book. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel and we thank you for Bible prophecy that helps us to understand what is going to happen in the future as an overwhelming surprise to our world. And we humbly but earnestly pray that your spirit will help us understand the words of scripture that we will read now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you for watching today's program. We would like to send you a book entitled The End of the World. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC1. Have you ever wondered who the final generation will be? What will be their experience? What does the Bible have to say about this important topic? For answers to these questions, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC1. And now, Pastor John Grossball. Approximately 500 years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, a prophecy was made concerning what he would do and how he would appear to the Jewish people. Notice what it says in Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. This prophecy, given about 500 years before, was fulfilled about five days before the crucifixion. On what we call today Palm Sunday, that's the time when Jesus made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. You can read about it in all four of the Gospels, Matthew talks about it like this. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And as they went down the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem, the multitudes began to rejoice. It says in Luke 19, it says, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. This was unlike any triumphal entry that the world had ever seen. Now the Romans, the Roman government, they had had hundreds of triumphal entries into Rome. And when a Roman general returned from a war, a battle, and they had a triumphal entry into, into Rome, behind the victors, behind the soldiers and the army, there came the band of captives who were chained. And they knew, of course, that some of them would get thrown to the lions, some of them would be sold as slaves, some of them would be forced to act as gladiators. And so it was a very mournful procession for those that followed behind. But this 
triumphal entry was unlike any triumphal entry of the Roman government because, as we just read, the people that were following along, they were rejoicing. And what were they rejoicing about? Oh, it says they were rejoicing because of all the mighty works that they had seen. Well, what were the mighty works that they had seen? Well, if you had been in that crowd that day, there were some people in that crowd that day that could say, I was blind until Jesus came, and now I can see. And there are other people in that crowd that could say, I was deaf until Jesus came, and now I can hear. And there are other people in that crowd that could say, I had leprosy, and I was ostracized, quarantined from all the human race until Jesus came, and now I am whole. There were people in that crowd that could say, I was paralyzed until Jesus came, and now I can walk. And there were people in that crowd that could say, there was a person in that crowd that could say, I was dead for four days and buried in a cave, and Jesus came, and now here I am. And there were people in that crowd that could say, my mind, my will was under the control of demons. I had no control over my appetite or my passions or anything else until Jesus came and set me free from demonic control. And as the people were relating all of these wonderful things that had happened, the crowd began to rejoice more and more. It says, they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest as they were approaching the city, as they were approaching the city. Something happened, though, that they weren't expecting. They were looking down, they were looking down toward the temple. Now, the temple was made out of white marble. There was a lot of white marble, stones, and gold. It was a beautiful, in fact, that temple was called one of the wonders of the world. You would think it would be a beautiful building because the Bible says that Herod had spent over 40, they had spent over 40 years beautifying and strengthening that building. The Bible says over 46 years they've been building it. You can build a fairly nice building in 46 years. And they were looking at this awesome sight. Everybody was rejoicing. The Bible has a lot to say about this sight, this place in the world. Notice what it says in Psalm 48. It says concerning Jerusalem, it says, beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It says in Psalm 50, verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. So they were looking at this city and they were looking at this beautiful situation and everybody else was rejoicing. But now notice what happens. Luke 19, verse 41. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Nobody else could figure out what was going on. This was a time of rejoicing. And here Jesus is, the majesty of heaven. And when he looks down on Jerusalem, it says he wept over it. Why was he weeping? Nobody else was weeping. Everybody else was rejoicing. Everybody else was happy, like you're supposed to be at a wedding. But one person is weeping. Why is he weeping? He's weeping, friends, because Jesus does not just know all about the past. He doesn't just know all about the present. But he knows what's going to happen in the future. And Jesus foresaw what was going to happen to that city. It happened 39 years later. And this is what it says in Luke 19, starting with 41st verse. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another 
because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now this was the city that had been honored by God above every other city in the world. For ages, God's prophets had uttered messages of warning to this city. It was in this city where priests had waved their censers and a cloud of incense arose with the prayers of the worshipers and ascended before the God of heaven. It was in this city where thousands of times the blood of slain lambs was offered, pointing forward to the real sacrifice, the Lamb of God that was coming. It was in the temple in this city where Jehovah had revealed His presence in the glory above the mercy seat. There was the base of that mystic ladder that connects earth with heaven that you read about in Genesis 28 or Jesus spoke of it in John 1, 51. The ladder which opens the way to the human race up into the holiest of all. Now Jerusalem could have stood forever without ever being destroyed if they had been willing to listen. But unfortunately, they were not willing to listen. And as a result, Jerusalem had already been destroyed once and it was going to be destroyed again. Notice what Jer Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 17. He talks about this. He says, Jeremiah 17 says, Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey, nor inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall be, if you diligently heed me, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day, to do no work in it, then shall enter the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Jerusalem and from the places around. But then it says in verse 27, But if you will not heed me, if you won't listen, to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Unfortunately, the history of the Jewish people, as you can read in the Old Testament, was a history of backsliding and rebellion. They had resisted heaven's privileges and grace. They had slighted their opportunities. This is the way it's described in 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter, 2 Chronicles 36. It says, They mocked the messengers of God, despised His words, and scoffed at His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people till there was no remedy. Finally, Finally, God sent to His people. After He had sent many prophets, many messengers, He sent to His people the majesty of heaven. In fact, He poured out all of heaven upon this world in the gift of His Son. The Son of God was sent to this world to plead with God's people, with the impenitent city. And Jesus, for over three years at this time, he had come to try to save this city from destruction, but they would not listen. The Bible says concerning this time that Jesus went about doing good. You can read that in Acts 10, 37 and 38. He went about in among the people doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. There were villages that there was no sick people there because Jesus had passed through. Not only that, you can read the mission of the Messiah in Luke 14, quoting from Isaiah. Jesus said that His mission was to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those that were bound, 
to restore the sight of those that were blind, to cause the lame to walk and the deaf to hear, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, and to preach the gospel to the poor, as you read in Matthew eleven five. Everyone was addressed by Jesus Christ. His gracious invitation to everyone was the same. He said to mankind, He said, Come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But what was the response to His invitation? The response was, He was rewarded with evil for good and hatred for His love. He steadfastly pursued His mission of mercy, Never were those repelled who sought His grace. But the waves of mercy were beaten back by stubborn hearts. Israel turned from her best friend and only helper. He was the only one that could save her from destruction. But the pleadings of His love were despised. His counsels were spurned. His warnings were ridiculed. And my friend, the hour of hope and pardon is not forever for this world. It passes, it's temporary. And if we do not accept the invitations of mercy, then there's only one choice left. And that is, we can receive the just consequences of our deeds. God's long deferred wrath against this city was about to be fulfilled. A cloud had been gathering over this city through ages of apostasy and rebellion, and now it was about to burst upon a guilty people. And there was only one person that could save them from the impending destruction, and that was the one person that they wouldn't listen to. His warnings, his invitations had been slighted and abused, and he was rejected, and he was soon to be crucified in less than a week. And when Christ should hang upon the cross of Calvary, well then Israel's day as a nation that was favored and blessed of God would be over. Now the loss of even one soul is a calamity. Worse than the loss of a whole world of material possessions. But here is the loss not just of one soul, but the loss of a whole nation, way more than a million people. The prophets had wept over this situation. If you look in the book of Jeremiah, this is what Jeremiah said about it. In Jeremiah 9, verse 1, he says, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And again, in Jeremiah 13, verse 17, he says, But if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. But now, now we have the Messiah Himself who can see with prophetic eye what will be the consequence of their rejection of mercy, of their rejection of truth. He knows what will happen. We just read it in Luke 19, 42 to 44. He's, he saw the walls surrounded by an alien army. He heard the, tre the tread of armies being marshaled to war. He heard the voice of mothers and children crying for bread. He saw the temple and all the beautiful houses and structures around it destroyed until he said, they won't, they won't even leave on, on you one stone upon another. It'll be totally destroyed, leveled with the ground. And looking down the ages, he saw the covenant people scattered in every land has, as has occurred, like wrecks on a desert shore. And in the temporal retribution about to fall on the children of Israel, he saw but the first draft uh, from that cup of wrath, which at the final judgment they must drain to the dregs. And so divine pity, yearning love, found utterance in these mournful words. 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. As he said to the Jews on another occasion, you can find it recorded in John 540, he said, you won't come to me in order that you might have life. My dear friend, there is no other God, there is no other person, there is no other intelligence, there is no other power that can give you eternal life except Jesus Christ. The Bible says, you can read it in 1 John 5, 10, 11, the one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. But Jesus saw in Jerusalem not just a terrible future that would result from their rejection of the Messiah, but he saw something else that would occur down at the end of time. Stay tuned, we'll see what it is. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Welcome back. Jesus saw in Jerusalem a symbol of an entire world at the end of time that would be hardened in unbelief and rebellion and hastening on to meet the judgments of God. He saw the record of sin. He saw the human misery, the tears, the blood, and in His infinite pity for an afflicted human race, He yearned to relieve them all. But even His hand, might not turn back the tide of human woe because few would seek Him the only source of help. He was willing to pour out His soul unto death to make salvation possible. But few would come to Him that they might have eternal life. And so the majesty of heaven was in tears. The Son of the infinite God was troubled in spirit and bowed down with anguish. And this scene reveals to us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It shows us how difficult a matter it is for even infinite power to save the guilty from the consequences of breaking the law of God. Jesus saw the world in the last generation in a deception that would be similar to the deception that caused the destruction of Jerusalem. The great sin of the Jews was in their rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world in the last generation would be their rejection of the law of God, the foundation of His government in heaven and earth. The precepts of Jehovah in the last days would be despised and set at naught, and millions of human beings who were in bondage to sin, slaves of Satan, doomed to suffer the second death, would refuse to listen to the words of truth in their day of visitation terrible blindness, strange infatuation. Jesus predicted in the Sermon on the Mount what would happen to a large portion of the Christian world in the final day of judgment. Here's what He said recorded in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It says, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of My Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
Jesus predicted that the last days would be a time of great lawlessness. He predicted it in Matthew 24, 12. And because the last days would be a time of great lawlessness, a time when people were breaking the law of God, even professed Christians breaking the law of God, as we just read in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, in the book of Revelation, God's people in the last days are consistently described as people that are obedient to the law of God. What it says in Revelation 12, 17. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you go to Revelation 14, 12, God's people again are described in the last days, and it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And if you go to the last chapter in the Bible, in Revelation 22, 14, it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. James, the second chapter, the apostle points out, that it is not permissible, it is not appropriate, it is not allowed to just keep the part of the law of God that we want to keep. Notice what James says in James 2, verses 10 to 12. He says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Notice here, James is speaking to Christians many decades after the crucifixion. And he says to Christians, he says, so speak and so do, so live, in other words, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. You see, God's law is the standard of the judgment. That is the standard that shows whether you have accepted the Holy Spirit into your life, whether the Spirit is controlling your life, or whether you're controlled by some other spirit. Oh, friend, the Jews' great mistake was they rejected the Messiah. They rejected Jesus Christ. That has resulted in a terrible consequence down through the centuries. The great mistake of the Christian world in the last days will be that they will reject the law of God. We saw it in Matthew 7. Jesus predicted it. It's predicted in Revelation over and over again that God's people in the last days will be those that keep His commandments. And James says, if you keep the whole law but you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. How is it for you, friend? Do you know the day of your visitation? We hope you have enjoyed today's program. Today's free book is entitled, The End of the World. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC1. When the last trump sounds and Christ comes to take His faithful people home, will you be among that group? Are you part of the final generation who will live to see Christ come? How can you know? If you are part of the final generation, what must you do to ensure that He is coming for you? Over and over again, the Bible warns us of the deceptions to come upon the world in the last days. And if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. To receive your free book, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788 and ask for offer GC1. From all of us here at Steps to Life Ministries, may God richly bless you as you continue to seek for His truth. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.